Aloha Biochem. In this video, we finish chapter three. We discuss ionic compounds and how to name them. All right, so we are finishing chapter three. In this video, we will cover sections 3.3, 4, and 5. Before we jump into the notes, let's recall in our previous lecture, we discussed ions and we saw that many elements, when they form ions for ionic compounds, their charge is predictable. So for example, the alkali metals, when they form ions, they are the plus one ions. Alkaline earth metals in group 2A form plus two charged ions. And in group 3A, aluminum in particular, forms a plus three charged ion. The nonmetals likewise have a minus one ion column, a minus two column, and a minus three column. So if we're talking about a, a bromine ion or bromide, it's going to be minus one. And if we're talking about a magnesium ion, it will be plus two. But these elements in this region form ions of variable charge. And copper, for instance, sometimes it's a plus one and sometimes it's a plus two. So if we mention a copper ion, we need to indicate what the charge is. And uh, iron is another example. Sometimes it's plus two and sometimes it's plus three. So in general, elements in this region right here, uh, if you're talking about one of their ions, you uh, will need to indicate what the charge is. All right, so in this video, we will discuss chemical formulas of ionic compounds, how to name them, and some of their physical properties that are important. And as a bonus, we will take a look at the structure of some of them and also some of their medical applications, which uh, can be pretty cool. Our first example is NaCl. We've all seen this one before. This is sodium chloride. Sodium uh, is a plus one ion and chloride is a minus one ion. And uh, let's just uh, make sure that yes, sodium is in the plus one column and uh, chlorine is in the minus one column and, and so uh, yes uh, the you know the charges in this case balance uh, you know you don't need two chlorides to balance the positive sodium they already balance and so the ratio is simply one to one for every one sodium you need one chlorine to balance it the way that you name ionic compounds is pretty simple the metal cation gets the full element name, so sodium, and then the non-metal gets an "-ide suffix." So it's not sodium chlorine, it's sodium chloride. Ionic compounds have pretty high melting and boiling points. If you take a look at the structure of sodium chloride, I think you can see why. Uh, ionic compounds have a very beautiful uh, geometrical structure and, and this shows you what sodium chloride looks like on the sub microscopic level. The pink ones are the sodium cations and the yellow ones are the chloride anions. And so you have all of these opposite charges interlocked in this nice geometrical structure. And imagine melting sodium chloride, you would have to disrupt all of these ionic bonds in order to melt it for for those ions to start to flow past one another. That's very difficult to do. And the temperature just needs to be jacked up really high in order to melt and especially to boil a substance. So, uh, you know, very high melting and boiling temperatures for, for sodium chloride and, and for the rest of the ionic compounds. Um, now, uh, interestingly, when you, when you look at this nice geometrical structure that's too small to see, it, it actually uh, is reflected in the, the macroscopic crystal structure. So here are a couple of very beautiful sodium chloride crystals. 
uh, it looks like this is naturally occurring, so uh, the kind of sodium chloride that you might find in a cave somewhere. And, and you see these, these nice crystals are, are simply a, a reflection of what's going on on the atomic ionic level. So pretty cool. Now, uh, sodium chloride, uh, you know, it does dissolve in water and this helps it uh, have uh, many medical applications. Uh, most importantly, it's used as an, uh, an IV fluid. So, you know, uh, fluids that are given intravenously, uh, sodium chloride is a very common one. And uh, if you go into any uh, medical establishment, you'll see uh, cabinets filled with uh, saline solution. 0.9% saline solution is a very common concentration of uh, sodium chloride. We'll talk more about IVs in chapter 8. Uh, so yes, important medical application. Our next example is CAF2. This is um, calcium and this is fluorine. So the name of this is calcium fluoride. Remember you get the full element name for the metal cation and then the non-metal gets the ide suffix, so calcium fluoride. Now calcium is in the plus two column and fluorine is in the minus uh, one column and uh, let's just verify that. Yep, there is calcium right there in the plus two column and fluoride is one of the halogens in the minus one column. And so uh, it makes sense that you have two of the negative fluorides to balance the plus two calcium. You, you see, these two by themselves don't balance. And so you have to have two fluorides to balance it. The ratio is one to two. You see, if you have one positive two cation, you need two negative uh, one charged anions for the structure to balance. And so the formula is CaF2. There are always t twice as many fluorides as calcium. Now, the larger uh, charge on the calcium uh, makes the ionic bonds even stronger, and, and calcium fluoride has an even higher melting and boiling point. This substance is not soluble in water, uh, however, unlike sodium chloride. I will show you a, a picture of a calcium fluoride crystal. Again, a nice, uh, beautiful geometrical pattern in the, in the crystal. And this one has a nice green tint to it. So I think this was used as uh, kryptonite in the Superman movies, uh, calcium fluoride. Uh, calcium fluoride doesn't have uh, much of a medical application. However, it is used for the production of HF, which is uh, hydrofluoric acid, a very, very corrosive acid. And, and so uh, maybe we'll talk about HF when we uh, get into covalent compounds in the next chapter. Our next example is MgO. Uh, Mg is the element magnesium and O is oxygen. So the name is uh, magnesium oxide. Remember the full metal name and then the non-metal gets ide. So magnesium oxide. Uh, these two elements form ions of predictable charge. Let's just uh, verify that. So magnesium is right above calcium in the plus two column and oxygen is in the minus two column. So uh, yes, you know, the charge is balanced this time. Uh, so uh, we don't need two of these to balance that. It's just one of these and one of those. So the formula is very simple. Uh, magnesium oxide has even larger charges on both of them. And so very, very high melting and boiling points. That's usually the trend. The larger the charges magnitude, the harder it is to melt and boil them, but, but not always. It's, it's a general trend. Magnesium oxide is not uh, water soluble, but it does dissolve in acid. And uh, this gives it uh, certain medical applications, especially in uh, digestion issues. So when you uh, take magnesium oxide uh, orally and it goes into your stomach, the stomach acids help dissolve it and, and that can provide heartburn relief. Uh, it's used as an antacid, even a laxative. 
um, as well. And uh, plus, uh, you know, this substance can be a magnesium supplement as well. So I'll show you some magnesium oxide. You see that uh, nice, beautiful crystal like ionic compounds often have. Uh, if you ground this crystal up into powder and uh, then, you know, mix it with water, there you go. There's your milk of magnesia, you know, that stuff that you see in the drugstore. So, um, magnesium oxide. Our uh, next example is Al2O3. Al is aluminum and O is oxygen. And so the, the name is aluminum oxide. Now, aluminum and oxygen also form ions of predictable charge. Uh, here it is. Aluminum is in the plus three column and oxygen's in the minus two column. So w we know what the charge is. Uh, you know, th this time they don't balance. And so the way to get it to balance is, you know, if the aluminum's a plus three and oxygen's a minus two, you bring, you know, you bring this two down, you're going to need two aluminums and you bring this three down, you're going to need three of those oxides. And you can see that if you do have that ratio of two to three, two aluminums gives a total of plus six and three oxides gives a total of minus six. Now that balances. And so the formula Al2O3 is a balanced structure. Okay, uh, pretty high melting and boiling points for this one too. It's also not soluble in uh, water. Uh, ionic compounds sometimes are, sometimes they're not. It's hard to predict when they are or not. Or are not. Um, uh, not too many medical applications. Um, however, it is used as a filler in sunscreen and cosmetic um, pastes. So, you know, uh, not quite the active ingredient, but it provides like the bulk of the material. Uh, so certain sunscreens have it and certain cosmetics do. And it's a pretty hard substance. So if you ground it up in a powder, it can be used uh, as an abrasive polishing agent, uh, such as in CD uh, repair, you know, pastes, and also even toothpaste. So, you know, you scrub your teeth. It has some of this stuff in there. It can help kind of, uh, you know, clean the teeth. Um, it's used in uh, aluminum production and aluminum foil, you know and also electrical insulation. There are many, many, many uses of aluminum oxide. I'll show you one cool one. Uh, you remember ionic compounds often have these nice, beautiful uh, crystals that form in caves. And, and so here's a, uh, you know, the first picture shows you nice, uh, you know, aluminum oxide crystal. Okay, it's in the crystal community, it's called corundum. If this crystal happens to have some impurities in it, chromium impurities, chromium plus three impurities, uh, it colors the crystal blue. And that's what sapphire is. You see a piece of uncut sapphire right there. So, you know, uh, you take some cheap corundum crystal, cost you a few bucks and, and it, you know, it, if it has some impurities, then all of a sudden you have very expensive sapphire, you know. So dirty corundum gives you sapphire if it has chromium impurities. Now, what about this? If it has iron, three pluses as an impurity, it colors it red. And that's ruby. So here's a piece of uncut ruby. So precious gems are often, uh, all they are are, you know, uh, crystals that would otherwise be cheap, but because of the presence of certain metallic impurities, it colors them uh, nicely. And, and so you see sapphire and ruby and, you know, so pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, what's our next example? Okay, our next example, here we go. Uh, this is a big one. Fe2O3. Fe is the element iron and O is uh, oxygen. And you might think the name would be iron oxide, but this time we need this thing in there, uh, this Roman numeral three to indicate the charge on the iron. This is iron three oxide. The reason we have to indicate 
the plus three charge on the iron inside the name is because iron is one of those elements in here. And, and iron forms ions of different charges. Sometimes iron is a plus two and sometimes it's a plus three. So if someone says they're talking about an iron ion, uh, you should ask them, well, which one are you talking about? Is it the plus two or is it the plus three? Now, uh, the, the plus two has also a common name. We can call it iron two, and this is iron three, but using the Latin, uh, you know, the Latin for iron is ferrum. Uh, the plus two is called ferrus, and the plus three is called ferric. Okay, ferrous and ferric. Uh, so the the metals that come from uh, Latin names, you know, like uh, ferrum and, and cuprum and aurum and stanum and plumbum, uh, they often ha have ions of different charges. And the one with the lesser charge ends in us, so this would be ferrous and that would be ferric. The one with the greater charge ends in ick. And so for copper, the Latin name is cuprum, we would call this cuprus, and that would be cupric. And then uh, lead is plumbum in Latin, and so this would be plumbus, and that would be plumbic. And, and, and we'll, one more, uh, tin, the Latin is stanum, and so the plus two tin ion would be stanus, and that would be stanic. Us and ick. And then uh, here's chromium, the no Latin name there. This would just be chromus and chromic. Okay, cobaltus and cobaltic for the element cobalt. No Latin name there either. Okay, so, so be aware that uh, when you have ions in this region, you in general need to indicate what the charge is. Okay, you can give their systematic name like chromium-2 or chromium-3 or, or iron-2 or iron-3, or you can use that common name like uh, ferrous and ferric. And people use those common names all the time. So, uh, okay, so where were we? We were at Fe2O3. So the Fe2O3, what are the charges here? Uh, we have three oxygens, and we know oxygen is a minus two. Oxygen is always a minus two. It's in the minus two column. And if you have three of them, that's a total of minus six. Now you have two irons, two irons, and so uh, they must both uh, hold a plus six charge combined. So each one gets a plus three. So, so this is a, if you just see the formula, uh, you're able to work out because this has minus six and this must have plus six, each one must be plus three. We're talking about the iron three ion or the ferric ion. So we could call this iron three oxide or ferric. You need to indicate the charge of the iron inside the name using either the systematic or the common name. Okay, now iron three oxide has a pretty high melting uh, point. And if you heat it, if you melt it and you heat it much higher, it will eventually just decompose. You cannot boil this. Uh, it just breaks down. And that happens a lot. Um, you know, sometimes substances just don't boil. They just break down in, into simpler substances. So there is no boiling point here. And, and iron three oxide or ferric oxide is not soluble in water. Its main application, you ready for this? Rust. This is what rust is. Iron three oxide is rust. Okay, so I'll show you a picture of, of iron three oxide, nice red powder, you know, and, and you, could, you could find, you know, some crystals too, nice beautiful crystals, but you, you ground it down into powder and, it, and um, you know, this is what happens to iron when it mixes with oxygen. So if you just have like some iron, maybe a chain link, which has a lot of iron in there, if it just sits out in the air, eventually it'll form rust on the surface. You know, this red rust on the surface, that's the ferric oxide or the iron three oxide. Um, one application though is it, it can be used as a pigment in certain lotions, so calamine lotion. Uh, has that nice pink color and that's due to the the rust or the the, fer the ferric oxide inside there
All right, got copper coming up next. Uh, Cu2O, Cu is copper and O is oxygen. And so the name here, it's not copper oxide. Uh, the, copper is one of those elements where we need to indicate the charge. It's copper one oxide. The charge on the copper here is plus one. We know that because oxygen is, is always a minus two. Let's, let's just, you know, remember oxygen is, is in the minus two column. So we know the charge on the oxygen. Copper is in here and, and copper sometimes is a plus one, sometimes is a plus two. So which one are we talking about uh, in this case? Well, if we have one negative two charged oxygen and two coppers, that, you know, the negative two must be balanced by a positive two. So, the, so each copper gets plus one for a combined total of plus two. So this is the plus one copper, you know, and, and so the name uh, would be copper one oxide or cuprus. You remember us and ick, us and ick. If it's the lesser of the two, it's us, and the greater of the two, it's ick. So this would be cuprus, that would be cupric. Okay, so we could call this cuprus oxide. Um, pretty high melting and boiling temperatures, like most ionic compounds. This also was not soluble in water. And uh, cuprous oxide can be used as a pigment and also as a fungicide. So here's, um, you know, cuprous oxide looks kind of like rust, um, you know, powderized uh, cuprous oxide. And it's used as, as a fungicide. And uh, so, you know, if you're a farmer, you like to grow things, you might have some copper fungicide. It's got that cuprus in there. Um, next one is uh, uh, NaNO2, NaNO2. So this is uh, the element sodium. Now NO2, when you see uh, you know several nonmetals like one and then several oxygens, those are the polyatomic anions. NO2 uh, is an anion. Uh, it, you know, this whole thing is an anion. It's the NO2 minus anion, and, and this is called nitrite. So let's, um, let's find that list of polyatomic uh, anions. It's, uh, here we go. So table 3.5 in your textbook has some common polyatomic anions. So carbon has several of them, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, carbonate, uh, CO3, the whole thing collectively carries a minus two charge. Um, you know, nitrogen has a couple and, and NO2 minus is called nitrite. So there are several others. You don't have to memorize these, but it's good to be able to reference this table. So NO2, whenever you see that in a formula, that's nitrite. And it's, each one is a negative one charge. So the, the, this, these three atoms collectively carry a negative one charge. This is a polyatomic anion. It's like a charged molecule. Okay, so uh, sodium, uh, you know, Na, we know that's a plus one. That's in the plus one column. And NO2 is, is a negative one charged polyatomic anion. And so the positive sodium balances the, the negative nitrite. And the way that you name this, uh, you get the full element name. We don't need Roman numerals after the sodium because uh, sodium is always uh, plus one. Uh, you know, I'll remind you that sodium's in the plus one column. Uh, there it is, right there. Okay, so no Roman numerals needed. It, it's only for the, the ones in here that you need to indicate the charge. Okay, so uh, just sodium, and then you just name the polyatomic anion. So this sodium nitrite, all right? So uh, the, those polyatomic ions are often end in it or eight. Uh, so this one is nitrite. Now this uh, substance right here, um, its melting point isn't so high. Uh, it's 271 degrees Celsius. And if you go much higher than that, it decomposes. It's very soluble in water. And it does have an interesting application. So let me show you the application. It's, um, 
very popular application, especially here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, where is it at? Coming up. Come up. There you go. Okay. So if you ever had spam, uh, spam is canned ham or canned meat. I don't know what kinds of meats in there, but it's, it's very tasty. Um, so uh, canned meats and sausages often have preservatives in there that you know help uh, prevent the growth of bacteria like botulism and, and and sodium nitrite is a good preservative that prevents botulism in uh, many canned meats and so you'll see it as one of the ingredients on there it also helps colorize the meat it gives it that nice reddish color <laughs> so uh, uh, sodium uh, nitrite is a good food preservative and sausages and canned meats and it's also a colorizer Okay, so here's another one with a, a polyatomic ion. So this is Ca, that's calcium, and NO3. NO3. So we just saw NO2. So what's NO3? It turns out that's nitrate. Um, let's go back to that table, uh, table 3.5. Um, oh, is that, is that it? No, that wasn't it. Okay, sorry, it's around here somewhere. Um, here we go. So you see, um, NO2 minus, that's nitrite. NO3 minus is nitrate. So you'll see, um, you'll see ites and eights all over the place here, you know, sulfite, sulfate. Um, so we're, we're talking about nitrate here. NO3 is nitrate, and it's also negative one charge on this. So um, uh, here we go. Going back to this, we have calcium and then NO3 is nitrate. So this guy, you have two of them, okay? So each one is a negative one charge and then calcium is in the plus two column. Uh, you know, calcium is, is definitely always a plus two ion in ionic compounds. So it's, it's an alkaline earth metal and and like all the others, it's a plus two ion. Okay, so uh, the calcium is a plus two, and, and yes, it does balance the two negative nitrates, and so yes, this formula makes sense, you know. And the name of this, you get the full L, uh, metal name, calcium, and then the, the name of the polyatomic ion, nitrate, calcium nitrate. It's got a pretty high melting point, 561 degrees Celsius. It decomposes hotter temperatures than that, so you cannot boil it. It's very soluble in water. Anything that has nitrate is usually very soluble in water. Uh, an important medical application, it's used as a uh, uh, ingredient in a cold pack. So uh, the way a cold pack works is you have the, you know, the the calcium nitrate in a pocket on one side and then some water on the other side. And then when you break the seal, the water mixes with it and that causes the temperature to decrease. And so a uh, good cold pack, uh, you know, application. Cold packs are really important in medicine. You know, uh, if you don't have any ice uh, around, you know, you can still uh, cool down, uh, you know, a certain regions of the body if needed. Our last example is uh, BASO4, BASO4. So BA is barium and SO4, that's the polyatomic anion sulfate. Okay, this is SO4 with a minus two charge, all right? SO4 with a minus two charge and BA has a plus two charge. You see barium is also an alkaline earth metal. It's in the plus two column. And then SO4 is, um, is a polyatomic ion of sulfur. There it is. It's, it's a sulfate. It's a minus two polyatomic ion. Okay. So the plus two charge on the barium balances the minus two charge on the sulfate. And so you just need one of these and one of those. And, uh, and the name would just be a barium uh, sulfate. Okay. The metal name. No Roman numerals needed because 
it's you know always a plus two um, it's always a plus two so no Roman numerals needed to indicate the charge and then just the name of the polyatomic ion sulfate now there's something interesting about the uh, the barium plus two it's way down here and, and when you get to big atoms that are down uh, near the bottom of the periodic table they have a tendency to absorb x-rays and barium is no exception uh, barium is a, a rather large atom that uh, interacts with x-rays it absorbs x-rays and so for that reason it has, uh, you know, th this substance for that reason has an important medical application. It's used as a contrast agent in x-ray imaging. Okay, so if you take x-rays, uh, usually, you know, you think of x-rays as you're taking a picture of the bone. You know, x-rays pass right through the body, but not the bone. Well, it doesn't pass through barium uh, sulfate either. And, and if, the, if the patient, uh, you know, uh, takes some barium sulfate in the form of of a little shot, you know, orally. Uh, you have some barium sulfate given as a shot. Then look what happens. Uh, look what happens. So here's a normal X-ray of a, of a, an abdomen gastrointestinal tract with with no barium sulfate. But if the patient takes a shot of barium sulfate and then the X-ray is taken well you know the barium sulfate uh, kind of uh, goes all throughout the digestive system the gastrointestinal tract and it it basically absorbs x-rays too so you can get a very nice image of the gastrointestinal tract and 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 use it for diagnostic purposes okay and since uh, since barium sulfate is not soluble it doesn't get absorbed into your bloodstream and stuff like that it'll eventually pass right through the body okay so because it's not soluble in water and it blocks x-rays uh it it's used as a good contrasting agent in x-ray imaging so you know x-rays uh, ct scans anything that uses x-ray uh, imaging um, and especially useful uh, compound when you're trying to get the x-rays of the gastrointestinal tract because it, it'll quickly flush through your body. Now barium sulfate replaced the older more dangerous contrasting agent uh, thorium-4 oxide. Thorium-4 oxide thorium is also way down on the periodic table. It's in fact in that island. Uh, let me you know do I got thor... Uh, Where's where's that? I got um, show you thorium down here. Um, okay, so thorium is way down at at the bo uh, bottom right there. Um, so thorium four oxide used to be used as a contrast agent, but the problem with this one was. In addition to absorbing x-rays, it's also radioactive. So the patients were taking this substance and yes, it, it would give good x-ray contrasting, but it would also, uh, you know, the patient would become radioactive and, uh, you know, event, and it ended up causing some serious problems for many people. And so the use of, um, of uh, thorium-4 oxide was phased out, you know, uh, early in the 20th century and then uh, barium sulfate has, has been used since then. There are other contrasting agents out there. Uh, this is a, a good one still in use. Um, now along the lines of contrasting agents, there's one other um, ion, uh, you know, that has interesting properties. It doesn't absorb x-rays but the gadolinium plus three ion has certain magnetic properties which make it useful in magnetic resonance imaging techniques so mris mras and mrvs mris are magnetic resonance you know in general for various areas of the body mras is is when you're doing magnetic resonance uh, for the arteries and mrvs is when you're doing it for the veins and so if you give a patient some gadolinium plus three, a gadolinium is, um, 
uh, way down there on the, the periodic table too. Where is it at? It's, it's uh, right there. Okay. Uh, so it's right there. It has certain magnetic properties which, um, which, which interact with the magnetic, with the magnet of the MRI machine. So MRIs work, it's basically a powerful magnet that, um, you know, uh, gets an image of the, of the body because of the magnetic properties of hydrogen atoms in the water molecules that are all throughout the body. And, and if the patient uh, is given some gadolinium, then, uh, you know, that causes some contrasting wherever there is water, which is basically all throughout the body. And, and I'll show you some... Uh, a couple of interesting, uh, interesting MRIs. Okay, so this one, this one right here is um, an MRA. It's an MRI for the arteries. So the patient was given an injection in the artery uh, containing this gadolinium ion, and uh, look at this time resolved. Uh, MRA, so pictures of the arteries as the gadolinium is working its way throughout the arteries. So it's a short little clip. You see that? It's coming into the heart, you know, and then basically working its way. So the gadolinium goes into the heart and then, then it goes out. So this is of the chest area. Really cool. Here's one more of the upper chest area and into the throat. So you'll see uh, the gadolinium coming into the heart and after the heart pumps it out, uh, you know, it comes in the veins and after the heart pumps it out into the arteries up into the you know, esophageal area where the thyroid is. So check this one out too. See the heart bumping. There comes the blood containing the gadolinium. There it goes out. You know, old blood comes in, fresh blood goes out. So really cool how um, ions can be used as contrasting agents. Okay, so some pretty interesting uh, medical applications for barium sulfate, uh, contrasting agent for x-ray imaging. Now, one more thing before we end this video. Uh, let's just do a couple of problems that are in your textbook. Just uh, just to kind of get you uh, a little bit more comfortable with naming. So here is problem number 62 in chapter three. And uh, we'll, we'll name some of these compounds. Let's do A through D, A through D. So uh, there's the answer. <laughs> Suppose you, pretend you didn't see that. So KF, KF. You could recognize this as an ionic compound because it has a metal and a non-metal. Okay, you remember metals get the full element name and then the non-metal gets the ide. So this is potassium and that's fluorine, so potassium fluoride. Okay, potassium fluoride. Now, potassium uh, doesn't need the, the Roman numerals to indicate its charge because potassium is always a plus one ion. Okay, it's only these guys that you need the Roman numerals in there. Okay, so you don't need it for potassium or this one or aluminum. Okay, so uh, that would be uh, potassium fluoride. And, and so that's the answer for A. What about this one right here? ZnCl2. Well, that's zinc and that's chlorine. And so is it zinc chloride or do we need zinc with some Roman numerals chloride? Well, zinc is in uh, this region right here. So you ought to have Roman numerals indicating the charge on the zinc. Now, since chlorine is a, is a minus one ion, it's one of the minus, it's in the halogen column. These are minus ones. Uh, what is the charge on the zinc? We know chlorine is a minus one, so what is the charge on the zinc? Okay, well you have two negative one chlorides, so that you have a total of negative two. The zinc must be positive two. And so uh, we should call this zinc two chloride. 
all right? It should be called zinc 2 chloride. Now, interestingly, zinc, even though it's in that region, 99.99% .99 of the time, it's, it's a plus two ion and, and most chemists know that. And so uh, a lot of times people will just drop that two in the name, just call it zinc chloride because very rarely is zinc anything other than plus two. So many of the elements in this region form ions of multiple charges, but there are a few that, you know, uh, are predictable, just a few of them. And, and you have to kind of know what they are, but you're, you're okay in calling the compound zinc two chloride. And, and if you know a little bit uh, more about the zinc, then you can call it zinc chloride. Either one works. What about C? This is copper and that's sulfur. That's copper and that's sulfur. So is it, is it copper sulfide or do we need Roman numerals? Well, yes, you do because copper, sometimes it's a plus one, sometimes it's a plus two. Is it copper one or copper two? Is it cuprus or cupric? Cuprus, cupric. Remember the us and the ick? You know, copper one, copper two are using the Latin name with the us and ick. Is it cuprus or cupric? Well, um, look at the sulfur. Sulfur, what's the charge on the sulfur? Sulfur is right below oxygen. It's a minus two on the sulfur. Okay. Sulfur is a, is a minus two, so it must be balanced by a total of plus two. So that means each of the coppers gets plus one because two of them would give you plus two. So the minus two is balanced by plus two so that each of the coppers has a plus one charge. And so that's the cuprus, copper one, cuprus, okay? So we're talking about this one. So the name would be copper one sulfide or cuprus sulfide. So let's do one more, um, SNO, SNO, that, that's tin and that's oxygen, tin and oxygen. Well, tin, sometimes it's a plus two, sometimes it's a plus four. Okay, so is it tin two or tin four or is it stannous or stannic using the Latin name with the with the suffix? Is it stannous or stannic or tin two or tin four? Well, oxygen we know is a minus two. So let's go back to the formula. So you have one tin and one oxygen. This is a minus two, so that must be a plus two. We're talking about the tin two or the stannous. And so this would be called tin two oxide or stannous oxide. All right. So um, E, F, and G, I'll just show you the answers for those. You can work that out. There's E, gold three bromide, lithium sulfide, and tin four bromide, or stannic bromide. So let's do um, just a couple more before we end this video. Problem number 72. Okay, we'll, we'll do a couple of these. Um, maybe the, the first three. Uh, copper one sulfite, copper one sulfite. Now this is nice because you're given the charge on the copper. You're, you're supposed to write the formula if you're given the name. So here we know this is a copper plus one. And what is sulfite? So you have copper plus one. And then what is sulfite? This looks like one of those polyatomic ions. Remember ite and eight are polyatomic ions. So uh, let's go find the uh, you know, the, the polyatomic ions. Um, oh, where are they at? Right down here. Here we are. Um, sulfite is SO3 minus 2. Okay, SO3 minus 2. And so if you go back to the problem, copper 1 sulfite... Well, copper one is a, is a copper with a plus one charge. And then uh, the, so copper with a plus one charge, the sulfite is SO3 minus two. So to get the formula, 
well, we need two of these copper ones to balance that. And so the formula would be Cu2 and then this, SO3. So there's the formula. Now what about this? Aluminum nitrate. Aluminum nitrate. You got another one of those polyatomic ions. So what is that and what's aluminum? I don't see Roman numerals, so apparently aluminum uh, is a predictable charged metal cation. Let's go look up both of these. Um, nitrate and aluminum. Uh, aluminum, uh, you should know, is a plus three ion, but we'll just verify that. So uh, the nitrate uh, is one of the polyatomic anions of nitrogen. It's NO3 minus, NO3 minus. And so what about aluminum? Aluminum's right back there. There it is. It's in the plus three column, right? Aluminum's always a plus three ion if it's an ion. And so uh, aluminum nitrate, aluminum is a plus three. Uh, nitrate is a minus one. So you're going to need three nitrates to balance that. And the formula is Al, NO3, three of those. So for the rest of these, uh, C, D, E, F, G, H, um, just show you the, the answers. Um, tin to acetate. There it is. You got your tin plus two ion and your acetate is that polyatomic anion. And so you need two of these acetates to balance the plus two, and, and here is the formula. Um, lead four carbonate. Well, lead is a is a plus four carbonate. There is the carbonate polyatomic anion, and so you need two of these guys to balance that. And the formula is PbCO three, and then parenthesize that too, because you need two of these things. Uh, zinc hydrogen phosphate. Zinc hydrogen phosphate. Hydrogen phosphate is the name of uh, this polyatomic anion. That's hydrogen phosphate. So zinc is always a plus two ion. Okay, even though it's in that region down there, you know, it's always a plus two ion. So uh, zinc hydrogen phosphate, uh, you know, they're both negative two charges, so you just need one of each. Um, manganese dihydrogen phosphate. Okay, manganese dihydrogen phosphate. Uh, there you go. Those are the two ions. If you look them up. And so you need two of these guys to balance that. So you need to put it in parentheses and get two of them. And then there's the formula. Ammonium cyanide. Ammonium is that one polyatomic cation. It's NH4+. Plus. Okay, this is the only time that you're going to see a cation that's not a metal. NH4+, plus, that's called ammonium. And cyanide is CN-. minus. It's a polyatomic anion. And both of these guys balance, you know, plus one charge and minus one charge, so there's a formula. You don't need two of these to balance that or two of those to balance that. They already balance. And the last one is um, iron to nitrate. You could also call this ferrous nitrate. There's iron two, and we've already seen nitrates before. And so you need two of these nitrates to balance that iron two. So there's a formula. Now, that was kind of a lot. This is a long video uh, that finishes up chapter three. Um, in the next video, we will start chapter four on covalent compounds. So stay tuned for that. Aloha.